25th hour radio show. You're tuned into the 25th hour radio show. I'm your host, Rob Fairless, and on behalf of my co host, Randy Ashby, we would like to welcome you to today's program. Uh, today we have on the show Pro Bass Fisherman John Cruz. John, how you doing? I'm doing great. I appreciate you guys having me on. Oh man, it's our it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. You know, uh, you know how many times I've, I've I've thought to myself when I'm at work, you know, screw this, man. I'm going to quit and become a pro fisherman. <laughs> In reality, is it really that simple? Uh, well, you know, you can you can quit your job and you can go fishing. Or you can quit your job and put up a whole lot of money and try to become a professional fisherman. Um, I, I tell people uh, becoming a professional angler is really similar to starting a small business. Uh, it takes quite a bit of time, quite a bit of, of, of capital to, to get started, and, uh, and and there's no guarantees as to how it's going to turn out. Uh, you know, there's a I'd say there's probably a 15% turnover rate. Um, a 10 to 15 percent turnover rate every year on the uh, on the elite series. So uh, you know, just because you're at the pro ranks doesn't mean you you're going to stay there very long. It doesn't mean you'll be uh, be good at it. Well, how did it all start with you? When did you first get hooked on fishing, and what's the transition like into becoming a pro? Um, it's it, it it's definitely the the pro circuit is is definitely a grind. I, you know, it started uh, fairly early for me. I, I really. Um, you know, as far as looking at a career, as I was growing up, I always knew I wanted to be in in business and and either own my own business or, um, you know, work with somebody to uh, uh, to, to start a business. And I, but I wasn't sure exactly how I wanted to do it. Uh, and then I enjoy, I was enjoying uh, tournament fishing as I was a teenager, and I really wasn't that serious about it. Just had fun doing it. Really, really enjoyed it. And once I got into college, I quit playing high, I quit playing sports. I played sports all through high school, and when I got to college, I had this competitive fire, if you will, that I wanted to compete in something, and I, I, I chose not to play any college sports. And and I really started to explore the, uh, the fishing aspect more and got more competitive with the tournament, started having more success. And, um, you know, as I was looking towards the end of my college career, I said, you know what? I might, now might be a good time to try to start a career as a professional bass angler and not try to try to start a, a different career and fish at the same time and be half ass at both. I figured I'd you know start out full bore and, and was able to do so and was able to uh, kind of scratch and claw my way along for enough years before I was uh, in order to to make a living at it. How rough was those first years? Uh, it w- you know it wasn't too bad. Um, I had a little money saved up by the end, by the end of college, and uh, the entry fees weren't near what they are now. Uh, you know, twelve, thirteen years ago when I was getting started, so uh, that that was a little easier to get into. Uh, our, you know, I had a truck and a boat, so I was I was you know, okay there. And I was living at home. I kept my expenses down. My only expenses were tournament entry fees and, and travel expenses, and gas wasn't near what it what it is now either. So. Expenses weren't as high as they could be now, and and um, I was able to win enough money to to sustain myself for three or four years until I was able to get a few sponsors to to help out and you know kind of get established into the sport. And uh, it's uh, it, it's a grind, you know. A lot of people say, "Man, you came out of nowhere." I'm like, well, you don't know where I've been for the last ten or twelve years. <laughs> you don't know what I've been doing. So uh, a lot a lot a lot of businesses, I guess, a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of things, a lot of athletes are, are kind of the same way. P- people think they come out of nowhere, but they don't see the, the years and years of uh, behind the scenes before they before they kind of pop onto the scene, if you will. Yeah. Now, are you basically your own boss, or do, or do you do all the work? I mean, as far as gaining sponsorship, or do you have people do that for you? How does that work? No, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a one man band. Most most pro, most of the pro uh, pro anglers are, are are that way, where they some of them have their wives that help out, and some of them. There's a there's a select few that have a, uh, a sort of an agent person that that helps them out with uh, sponsors and coordinate uh, appearances and, and things like that. But I, I actually do all of it myself. I'm kind of an independent person, and, and like I said before, I, I knew I wanted to get into business, so so I don't mind uh, dealing with the with the companies and and negotiating those kind of those kind of deals. I, I enjoy it, and um, and just you know this past year. Uh, in January, I started my own soft plastics uh, bait company called Missile Baits, and that's just uh, 
I feel like it's a compliment to, to what I do as a professional angler, and it it enjoy it allows me to you know to to divulge even more into the business side of uh, professional bass fishing, and I'm enjoying that a lot too. Man, if you don't mind, how cutthroat is the business of professional bass fishing? I mean, do sponsors excuse me do sponsors expect you to perform at a certain level at all times? Um, when you get to when you get to the pro level. Pretty most the industry is not that big, so most of the sponsors really they kind of know what they're getting when they sign up with a guy. They're most companies are pretty apprehensive about uh, jumping on to a new guy right off the bat. They they let them they usually let them go for a couple years and kind of see what the reputation ends up being. I mean, all they've got to do is ask three or four of the fellow competitors, "Hey, what kind of guy is this 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 guy?" and and they'll and, and they'll tell them. And so that's what I mean by it's a fairly small industry. And, if you've got a good reputation, um, then you know companies are more willing to uh, to sign you on, and and it's it's really a, a really a somewhat based on performance in the tournaments, but it's a lot of based on uh, how hard you work outside of the tournaments to uh, to help them sell products and and uh, promote their brand. Now, how many days do you spend out on the water in a year? How many tournaments on average? Well, when in early in my career, I, was, I fished uh, 20 or 22 tournaments a year, and most of those tournaments are all a week long. And, and you know, there was also some some pre fishing involved with those. So I was I was spending um, at least half or more of the year on the water uh, when I started out in my career. But I I don't spend that much time out there now. Um, I don't I feel like if I kept at that pace, I would burn myself out. You know, this is a career that you can have for. For thirty years or more, uh, kind of like uh, you know, professional golfers, they can they can it seems like they can just keep going and going and going. Um, but you know, and there's you know, football players and, and things like that. There's a real short it's a short window. So uh, mm-hmm. I feel like with with bass fishing, there's a lot bigger window. So I don't want to burn myself out, and so I reduce the number of tournaments that I fish, and it allows me to focus better on the ones that I do fish. I uh, find myself more prepared mentally and uh, you know and you know with my equipment wise. A little more prepared, and it seems to work out a little better for me. Fish, I'm fishing about uh, 13 or 14 events a year now. Well, that's pretty good. That, that ain't bad. That ain't bad at all. I actually thought you would spend uh, um, more time, but like you said, at the beginning of your career, you did. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought, now this is uh, an amateur fisherman, not a pro fisherman, <laughs> you know, and I thought, you know, that to, in, if you get into the pro fishing uh, game, you'd spend a lot more time like that. Well, you know, I, I I do spend um, you know I'd say eight, eight, ten, maybe twelve days on the water. Just you know, I wouldn't call it maybe fun fishing or testing baits, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's on a on a good year. And then I definitely um, probably have another twenty days of either appearances or on uh, you know making appearance on a on a fishing show or something like that. Another fifteen to twenty days a year of those and and then you got a lot of travel days because you have to travel to and from each of these tournaments you have to drive there and you know it's not far from virginia to oklahoma by airplane but dag on it's a uh, it's a long drive out there that's where the yeah. uh, fast masters classic is going to be this year ray you got a couple questions yeah yeah uh you know being being pro you probably done some fishing just a little bit everywhere how how long does it take you to figure out a lake man uh it it really kind of depends on the uh, on the type of lake, and if it's a if it's a type of lake that I've been to before, let's say uh, um, if it's in the cert, you know same like on the same river chain as a, of the other lakes that I've fished, it doesn't take too long to kind of break it down because you know what kind of stuff you're you're starting to look for. I'd say you know in a day or two you should get it pretty quick, um, and but then. There, there's some places that are that don't fish like other lakes, and it takes a little bit longer. It may take three, three or four days to really kind of dial it in and, and figure out what the fish are doing and how they're relating to cover. So um, there's been times where I drop my trolling motor, and in the first hour you catch, you know, a 20 pound limit, and you say, "All right, I'm ready for the tournament. Let's go. Let's get it going." But it that doesn't always happen like that. Do you uh, do you have a technique? You know, which it might be secret or whatever. But do you do you have a technique of finding your fish? Uh, I I don't I um a lot of it has to do with uh you know seasonal patterns uh how how deep the lake is clarity of the lake 
there, there's so many variables in fishing. That's one of the things I love about it. There's just there's just an infinite amount of variables, uh, and they're and they're constantly changing. They're they're not always all the same. You know, weather changes, sun angle changes. There's all these different things that that affect the fish and where they're going to position. So uh, there, no, I, I don't have one particular strategy or or anything like that. But you know, when you show up to a lake that 120,000 acres, say like uh, Toledo Bend down in down in Texas, you show up there. You better have somewhat of a strategy because if you just run around like, with a chicken with your head cut off, you're not going to figure anything out. You all you're going to do is spend time running around. So you need to kind of kind of have a game plan when you get to some of these big bigger lakes for sure. Well, that you talked about, you know, you've been doing this for 13 years, probably longer than that, I would imagine, but. Mm-hmm. Like we talked about, everything's changed over. Everything changes over time. You know, gas prices, uh, the the way a, a lake's laid out, or even change. Do you feel that the uh, bounty of fish has changed as well? I mean, the way the you know the way like the, the amount fish relate. Yeah, you know, like the amount of fish in a, in a in a lake will change due to the seasons and everything. Well, you know. Um... There, there's other factors really that that, that affect the uh, the population of fish in a particular lake or body water or river system, and mo- most of it is is directly tied to a habitat. A lot of people try to say, oh, this lake it just gets fished out, there's, oh, it just gets beat up. I don't don't believe the hype, man. Uh, the habitat if a lake has got the habitat, and what I mean by habitat is if it's got shoreline cover that's in the water. Uh, around the spawn and in, in, the, in the, the month or two following the, the when the bass spawn in the spring, that lake's going to be perfectly healthy. Um, some lakes are more fertile than others just by, by the rivers and, and lakes and whatever feeds it. But uh, if, as long as the, the lakes or rivers got lots of shallow water cover, then there'll be plenty of fish to catch, and it doesn't matter how many people are fishing for them. You know, you got lakes like uh, Lake Gunnersville. Uh, down in Alabama and the Potomac River up here, uh, northern part of Virginia, Maryland border, man, those lakes absolutely get pounded by by fishermen. But they've got t- both of them have tons of grass that the fish can can hide in right after the spawn, and and they just has they have so much shallow water cover that that the, the both of those bodies of water just still thrive year after year. What what is the this? And I'll let Robert get back to it because man, he he loves fishing. I'll tell you that right now. What is the what is the largest fish that you have ever caught? Oh man, you got you, you took one of my questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know the the biggest bass I've ever caught was a it was an 11 pound bass. I caught it in a Bassmaster event, but the bad part was I didn't get big fish that day. Somebody beat me out with an 11 pound one ounce bass for that event, but I I ended up making the top 12. In that tournament, so it was a. I had a good event, but that was uh, that was a little bit of a heartbreaker on that day, not to at least have big fish when that's the biggest fish I've ever caught in my life. But uh, I was I was fishing down a couple years ago down off the sh- coast of Florida, and I caught one of those Goliath groupers, and I, I think it was in the 300 to 350 pound range. I, that's that's by far the biggest fish I've ever caught. That that thing was pretty wild. Great. That is a <laughs> yeah, big I've seen fish. Yeah, that, that was cool. That was a cool deal. Did you put that fish that you caught that 11 pounder on your wall? No, I did. I caught it in a Bassmaster event. Everything you catch in one of those events, you have to turn back over to the uh, um, turn back over to the to the tournament official. But nowadays, with the uh, the fiberglass replicas, it, you you just get the length measurement and the girth measurement of the fish. Take a picture of it so you know the coloration, and you can have a taxidermist. Uh, replicate it with a fiberglass replica, and you can put that fish right back in the water. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> I mean, I'm going to go back to the, the tournament fishing for a second. When you fish in a tournament, I mean, how many days in advance do you have to prepare on the water where the tournament is? I mean, is there a certain amount of days? I, you mentioned earlier that you might fish it a couple of days or whatever. Does it all depend on the tournament? that you Well, you'll, it, you'll, it, at, at the top level, is is the elite Bassmaster Elite Series? That's that's the the best of the best. That's the major league, whatever you want to call it. And in those tournaments, there's a 30 days off limits period, whereas the anglers that are fishing the event cannot get any information about where the fish are located or what the fish are biting on. They can't they can't call their buddy that lives next to the lake, or they can't call a guy local guide and say, "Hey man, what's the fish doing?" Before they get there. 
So there's a 30-day off limit, and, and the anglers can't be on the water either. So once that 30 days is over, uh, there's a three-day practice period, on usually on a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and, and the anglers have three days to basically figure it out. And then after that, then the tournament, the Elite Series starts uh, on a Thursday, and they're usually Thursday, Friday. The whole entire field fishes. Then the uh, then they cut the field in half for the third day, and then they cut to the top 12 for the final day. So that's that's the progression of how the tournaments work. And most all the other uh, professional type tournaments are all relatively similar to that. How fierce is the competition when you're out there? I mean, you all pretty much know each other well enough to, you know, do a little friendly bashing of each other every day. Oh yeah, we we have a good time. We have a good time with it, definitely. And there's a it, the, it, the fishing and the intensity part is uh, I think it's unexpected to a lot of amateurs. They don't um, the level of focus and intensity that the professional anglers uh, uh, exhibit during during the tournament day is is unexpected. And I, I hear that a lot from the marshals and the, and the guys that ride in our boats with us during the tournament. They they underestimate that until they actually and and that's one thing that kind of opens their eyes up but i mean i've got i mean ha, i'm friends with the majority of the tournament field so um you know i mean, I, I don't hardly ever have any disagreements with anybody in, on the water and stuff like that and, and you know you got to be careful of what you do because there's a hundred guys that fish the, the trail every year and you, you know and the hundred the same hundred guys that go to all the all the events so if you uh if you do somebody wrong it won't take it. It won't take long, and that'll come back come back to you. So uh, that's kind of how that's kind of how that works. Hey man, I gotta ask you, what's the etiquette like out there on the lake? I mean, <clears throat> like I said, you're fishing a huge lake. It might not be, you know, might not might not matter. But let's say you're out there fishing, and you're not doing any good, man. And somebody over here you see is tearing them up. I mean, what's the etiquette? I mean, do you inch a little bit closer? Do you stay away? You know what I mean? Because that's pro- uh, a, lot, <laughs> a lot of it has to do with with where you're fishing and and how it's going. Um, you know, if they're if you're if everybody's fishing a community hole, uh, whereas there's a let's say there's a five acre bay of grass and there's 15 boats in it, and the guys on the the far left hand side of it, they all start catching fish, and the guys on the other side aren't catching any. Well, you can almost expect that those guys that aren't catching any are going to kind of drift over towards your way. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a little, it's a little, it's a little frustrating. I mean, if you're on the right side of it, it's a little frustrating. But if you're on the wrong side of it, it's not. And and so everybody will kind of gravitate to where the fish are biting. But then the, you could you could turn roll reversal the next day, and then the fish kind of move to the other side of the grass bed. And so you know, once somebody starts catching them over on that side, then everybody will shift over there. And that when it's a community hole like that, it's kind of it's almost expected. But if you're out there in the middle of a lake and you're fishing a a little drop or a little uh, brush pile or something out there in the middle of the lake, and you're all by yourself, and you're fishing it, and somebody pulls up on you, um, they better pull up. It better happen on the first day of the tournament. So you I mean, you got to kind of have to claim things on the first day of the tournament uh, in order not to be uh, accused of doing somebody wrong because that, that stuff does happen. And like I said, it's the same guys that fish every tournament, and, and the guys that do people wrong, it it'll come back to them. Let's, uh, let's talk about your missile baits now. I want, I want to uh, promote some of your your, your uh, fishing gear. Tell us a, tell us a little sure. bit about missile baits. You know, it, it came out of um, I was looking for the right opportunity um, with a to find the right company to to associate with and and to design baits because I was designing baits for the Spro Corporation, and but that was crank baits, and I was really enjoying that aspect of it and and got to you know understand the business side of. of uh, of the lure business a little better, and and I was looking for for the right soft plastics deal, and, and I couldn't. And, I said, and then it hit me. I said, well, why don't I start my own business um, in this? And and so that's what I ended up doing. And now I get to design design the baits, and I uh, get to test them, and you know have other people help me test them, and and uh, get you know get input from a lot of people, and you know kind of take everything and, and make it make it the way we want it, and. Uh, we get to do everything we want it the way we all want to do it. You know, we get to design the packaging, we get to design the boxes, we get to design the, you know, in addition to the bait, and we uh, decide where everything's going to be marketed. And I really enjoy that part of it because I feel like there's a uh, there's an opportunity to 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 create a new brand and um, and to create a a positive brand of 
soft plastic lures that people get to know as dependable. They know when they pick one up, it's well designed, it's well thought out, and it's proven already. Before they don't have to, they don't have to try them. They know they're going to be proven. That's that's what I'm trying to create with missile bait. That's got to be awesome to be a, to start off as an amateur fisherman like me. I, I can just imagine, you know, then become a pro fisherman and then have your own bait. You know what I mean? That that's that's just mm-hmm. the coolest thing. You know, that's just awesome. Um, when you're not fishing, man, what what's some of your hobbies? Um, I uh, I enjoy um, staying fit and, and working out. I like uh, like getting in the gym and and grunting. That's what I call it. I go in there and grunt, and I don't care anything about that treadmill. I do it to warm up, but then I like to get in there and and throw some weight around. I've got I've got uh, three kids and and uh, and a wife, so I, I love spending time with them. Uh, we get to spend a lot of time together when I'm when I'm at home, and and I really enjoy that aspect of it. So that's uh, that's about it. And in addition to the uh, to the fishing and the business side of it, that's about all I, all there's time for. I hear you. I got one more question for you before we wrap up this interview. Can you tell about <laughs> man? Man, I got a little cold. Can you tell all, all, right. all of us uh, amateur fishermen where we should be fishing right now in Southern Illinois, Southeast Missouri, and Western Kentucky? Man, um, I fished actually uh, a few weeks ago. I fished at uh, Kentucky Lake. And I know that's not too far from where you guys are. That lake is uh, can be pretty decent in the fall. Uh, it can be tough, but it can also be pretty good if the conditions get right. And, um, you know, when the conditions get right, a lot of those fish start moving back in those uh, little feeder creeks, uh, especially once you go south from uh, from the dam there a little ways. But uh, that lake that lake can be real good. And uh, I've, I've, that lake has been good to me in the past. I've got to have a couple uh, top tens there in some, some big tournaments. So uh, if I was in that part of the country, I'd, I'd I'd have a tendency to kind of veer my vehicle that way if uh, if I was around there. What about what about creeks, small creeks? Um, Maybe if, 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 water, if the water's right. down, if the water's down, um, then then those fish are gonna should gang up um, in the mouth within the first couple hundred yards of those of those creeks, and and it would be real easy to find them because you got to look for the bait fish wherever you see the shad. Uh, mm-hmm. Flicking, and you'll see them. And they'll, you may even be breaking a little bit, um, but they'll definitely be there. Uh, you know, pro little John crankbait, and, and in some kind of a shad pattern is pretty pretty tough to beat on them. Uh, that's what I was fishing a couple weeks ago up there. Had uh, had some good fish. Had a couple four pounders and uh, some other decent fish. So uh, that that would uh, that would be the what I'd be looking for. I'd just look for the shad around the mouth of those creeks, and that'll uh, that'll point you in the right direction there. Well, cool, John. Man, we're almost out of time, but before we go, can you tell everyone uh, where they can go to get more information about uh, you and your bank, your you know social media and stuff like that? Sure, man. We're uh, we're all over the internet. Got uh, got johncruise dot com and got a Facebook page, uh, John Cruz, and and also on Twitter with the Cruise Missile is my my handle or username on on Twitter. So kind of stay active on all the social media and the web stuff. Uh, Missilebaits dot com. You can see all the all the missile baits that we've we've got so far, and we've got new ones coming out around first of the year. So keep your eyes out for that stuff, and uh, and it's uh, it's uh, it's enough to keep me busy. That's for sure. Randy, you got anything else to say to John? Man, it's just it's been a pleasure talking to you. If you're ever down this way again, you should give Rob a call, and you guys could compare notes sometime at the Big Kentucky Lake. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a place I'm very fond of, and uh, that'd be that'd be a good time. Well, man, thank you for being on our program, and you're always welcome to come back, and, and good luck uh, in all your endeavors, John. All right, Rob and Randy, I appreciate you guys having me on, man. All right. Have a good one. All right. Thanks. Well, this has been the 25th Hour Radio Show. Uh, join us next Sunday at 4 p.m. Central Time, when our guest will be Nashville touring artist Benjamin Schultz. For Randy Ashby, I'm Rob Ferris, and we will talk to you later.